I've often been asked, where is God? Where is God? Yes. <laughs> where is God? Oh, he's agreed. Where is God in the midst of some of these experiences, situations that we hold as horrific? We judge them as horrific. We say, oh my gosh, how can this happen? Because our humanness feels just that way. How can we explain it? Well, I hope to clear that up a little bit today. However, we're used to unity talks being those kind of talks. You come and you leave and you feel good and you go, oh yeah, it's so great to be alive. You may not feel that way when you leave here today. This is not a normal unity talk. So, sorry. <laughs> you get to deal with that one. So I want to talk to start with that, um, that we flow like water, that the journey of our lives could be likened to water. It kind of mirrors who we are in the path through life. Because water begins in the earth and it flows. It may come from the sky, it may come from the melting snow, but it flows and it goes into rivers and streams and it hits boulders and goes around the boulders and keeps moving. It doesn't let the obstacles that it meets get in its way. We come into the world, into our lives, with particular characteristics, into a specific family, knowing that we have gifts and challenges. Oh, we probably don't know them when we come into this world. But as we grow, we learn that we have specific gifts and we have specific challenges and that we live in the parameters of the banks of the river. And there are times that we feel that the river overflows and we feel that we're out of control or that the world is out of control. Or how can life be this way? Water is a great teacher that shows us how to move through the world with grace, ease, determination, and humility. When a river breaks at a waterfall, it gains energy and it moves on. It moves on. You've seen how over the waterfall there's so much more energy. And this is adapted from a daily own, just wanting to be sure that I give them their, their due. So water can inspire us. It can inspire us not to become rigid or cling to fear, but to move. Water is brave, and it doesn't waste time with fear. Now, I know we have fear in our humanness. We fear what is, what might be. We fear is somebody going to love us, not love us. Are we going to have enough, not have enough? We have those fears, right? But water doesn't worry about that. It just moves. And even if there's a hole, the water just fills it. So we can learn from water, realizing that water doesn't hold back. It just makes this flow. And as it flows, it eventually gets to a place that it reaches out, it spreads out, it moves into an ocean, a larger body of water, a lake. It moves into greater fullness, just as we have the opportunity as we come across life to move and to expand and to join the larger body of human consciousness. So <clears throat> we know that there is one presence and one power. That's one of the basic unity beliefs, is it not? Do you believe that? Is that what's called us to be here? Because so many of our uh, more traditional spiritual paths say that there's good and there's evil and that there's separation. But in unity, we say we're all one. It's all together. We're there together. So how do we reconcile when there are problems, that situations that we consider problems in the world? How do we respond? Do we lose our identity? Do we lose control? Do we forget who we really are? Do we forget to move into something bigger? Or do we try our best to follow the lead of the water, to join into something greater? So Charles Fillmore, in his writings and his talks, metaphysically explains water. And he says that water is that place 
of emotion. It's a place of weakness. It's also a place of strength. It's a place of cleansing. It's a place of renewal. So water is one of those complicated words that we can use in many ways. But I'm talking about that water that empowers us, the living water of Christ. That living water that calls us up and gives us the energy to go on. We could let it, we could let the undertow of water come and pull us down. But we're looking at that water that lifts us up. It takes us to the beautiful opening of the, uh, of the ocean of the moreness. <clears throat> so, we can face the dark moments and run away from them, or we can simply expand. If we live without resistance to life, then we move forward. And yet, so many people ask, how can it, this happen? And where is God? Where do these horrific events come from if there's only love? How are we going to reconcile this? How do we forgive the events of U Valley? the events of 9-11. Is there good in the midst of this? And if there is good in the midst of this, are we there too? Can we be in the midst of something that appears to be less than good in our humanness? How do we reconcile this? Where is God? Where do we flow? So often in world, the world today, we talk about us and them, right? Us and them. Those people over there, these people over here. I am, da 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 da. They are. They are unloving. They are unaccepting. They are. No, they aren't. Because they are part of us. And we are part of them. As I said, this might feel a little unusual for the unity talk, but... We're all one, folks, even with those that accomplish things that we feel is difficult. So if we go beyond our individual egos and become part of the larger consciousness, the larger movement of life, then we are going to experience a forgiveness Forgiveness of all that goes on. A forgiveness, a knowing, a compassion. Can you experience compassion in the midst of terror? Can you find that place? And by you do so. The deadliest of school shootings in the United States took place April 16, 2007, when a gunman killed 32 people and then killed himself at Virginia, Virginia Tech. Now, I want to be, stop right here for a moment and be really clear. This is not a political talk, and I am not for or against gun control or any of those things right here and now. I'm just giving a talk and putting this information out. I'm not trying to change or sway. But I want us to realize that these things happen, and what do we do with them? When you heard about what happened in New Valley, you probably just did just what I did. And I went, oh, no. Ah. Do you think that helps the situation? Are we coming above the situation when we deep dive down into that place of grief and despair? I'm not saying we don't have it. I'm not saying not to feel it. Hear me well. But I am saying... The solution is when we come above. The solution is when we turn away from what appears to be so painful and we turn to God. We look for something good. We forgive in the midst of a difficult situation. I'm just going to let that be for a minute. So, on September, excuse me, on April uh, 16th, 2007, there was a young man who was riding to school with his sister. His sister was a little older. 
she was very bright and always very happy and joyful and just uh, had a good outlook on life. And, but as they rode to school, he got into the car late because he was messing with his hair. And then he and his sister got into a discussion about what radio uh, station they would listen to. So by the time they got to school, it was looking like they were arguing. And he got out of the car and he slammed the door. And that was the last time he spoke to his sister because he was in Columbine. And he goes in, and at lunch, he decides to, to study. He's a good kid. He goes in to study in the library. And teachers run in and tell him to get under the table. And he does, along with his two best friends. And the gunmen come in. And the one looks around as if he's God and decides he's going to live and he's going to die. And he shoots people. And the young man is sitting there in total fear praying to God. He is praying to God. His focus is on God. I want you to hear this. He's focused on God. And suddenly, he hears that he is to get up and leave, crawl out from under that table, and leave the room. And he does. And he realizes that the gunmen have left. And so he grabs all the people that are in there, or awake, alerts all the people that are in there, and they run out. I believe that there were 12 other kids along with him that escaped this gunman who then came back into the uh, cafeteria and killed the rest of the kids. As you can imagine, this young man was pretty devastated by this experience. He, he and his sister were close. He couldn't believe his last conversation with his sister was arguing. And he wanted to forgive, and he knew that he was to forgive. He recognized that forgiveness is giving up the false for something true, erasing error. But he was devastated. So here's a picture of the two of them. Kind of moving ahead there. But. So after two years, when he was this whole time very uh, distraught, the church that his sister was involved with called and asked if he would go on a mission trip to Africa because his sister was supposed to be doing that that year. And so he said yes. And he went and he did not find that place of love and joy when he got there. It was hard for him. And he was walking around the streets going, why, why, why? As many of us would be. And a man came up to him and said, son, what's wrong with you? And the young man told him. And he told him everything. And the man listened. He just listened to every word, every feeling, every emotion. And he said, I understand. Seventeen of my family members were killed in a massacre. I understand. He said, but let me tell you something. If you forgive, it is like setting a prisoner free and finding out that you were the prisoner. You know, I think it's like unforgiveness is drinking poison and expecting the other person to die. But this is setting ourselves free when we do our forgiveness work. So this man said that to him, and he got it. And he took it home, and he said upon arriving, everybody in his family knew that he was different. He made a decision in that moment to take something that had been horrific, horrible, nasty, and very life-changing to turn it into something good. His sister had written an essay, and she said that she wanted to be a chain reaction of good. I just love that. She wanted to be a chain reaction of good in the world. Do you? Are you willing in the midst of all that's going on to be the chain reaction of good? I hope so. <clears throat> so, he comes back. He they're different. He's working on this. 
He talks to his dad. They decide to start a nonprofit called Rachel's, um, what? Rachel's Change. Challenge, that's right. Rachel's Challenge. So they establish this nonprofit, and he begins going around to schools to speak about what young people can do if they're feeling angry, if they're feeling excluded, what they can do to stop gun and violence. He went around to schools. He talked to millions of kids, sharing what could be done. He wanted to make a difference. He wanted to bring joy. He wanted to be a beacon of joy. He said, I had two friends that were killed, and I lost my sister. I wanted to turn it around to be a beacon of good. So where is God in the midst of this? It's right here in your heart. When you make that decision, and again, I'm not saying don't feel your feelings, but I'm saying you get to choose. There are things we can do. There are ways that we can get involved. If you watch the news and get down and go, whoa, 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 I invite you to let it be a call to prayer. That's what the news is when it's so hard to hear. It's a call to prayer. We don't have to stay there. We can look for the good. We can be grateful. We can stop complaining about those things that we complain about all the time. You know? You know those little things? Uh, How many of you complain about the heat? We can stop complaining about the heat. It's a negative energy that we're bringing into the human consciousness. Do we want to do that? Or do we want to lift our world to a higher consciousness, to a greater understanding of who we are as expressions of God? You see, this sounds like a tough lesson. But this is just us finding God. So when do you last remember our country coming together with the greatest of energy? 9-11. We came together, didn't we? We pulled together as we seldom pulled together. In the midst of difficult things, we pulled together. Is that a call to God? Is this the only way God can get our attention? Maybe. And maybe it's for us to come above, to lift ourselves so we don't have to have these horrible situations that, are, that we experience. So I ask, what would God do? What would Jesus do? What would Jesus do in the midst of this? Would he not find love? Would he not find love? So we get to forgive ourselves. And to forgive others. And it can be a real challenge to our humanity. But it's not to say that we can't do it. So through Rachel's challenge, 26 million students have been present to his presentations. Rachel, he says, inspired millions to start a chain reaction of kindness and compassion. That's a big one for us. At the end of the day, if we can find something to be thankful for, we can start to change who we are, and we can start to change the the consciousness of our world. And Scott wasn't the only person that did this. We also have Sandy Hook Promise. And if you haven't heard of the Sandy Hook Promise, it's incredible. Parents and teachers, educators have come together to put a program together to help young people if they're feeling isolated. How can they reach out and begin to talk? If they see someone isolated, what can they do? If they see someone they're worried about, how can they change that? They're making a difference. Are we willing to make a difference? So there's the program of live in a real world. It provides diverse and educational opportunities, focusing on critical issues that are related to mental health. 
It focuses on safety and physical health and helping teens when they're struggling. We have people that are making a difference in the midst of what appears to be something difficult. Are you willing in your life today to do that now? Are you willing to hold a high watch? If you're on the Empire State Building, you see the ground much different than if you're on the ground. When you're on the ground, you see the litter, right? But if you're up there, you don't see litter. It's true. <coughs> How many of you know about the Golden Key? Good, many of you do. There's um, a couple of sheets out there with some information on the Golden Key if you don't know about it. The Golden Key is about turning our attention from that place that we, can, that we judge or consider painful, hurtful, or bad. It's about turning to God in the midst of whatever. When you have a negative thought, call on the God energy that lives in you. That is the golden rule. It is so very, very simple. And for me, I have this vision. You know, if I'm getting in a bad place and things are bothering me, I just literally go, Oh, I turn my back to it. So I'm focusing on something new. I'm focusing on something new. Pablo, the man that worked with the dogs, he was dying. He was very ill. He had high fever. And he sent one of his assistants to the river, and he said, bring me back some mud. And so they did. And they were like, what do you want the mud for? He said, the best time of my life was when my mother would take me to the river when she was washing clothes and I would play in the mud. And he said, I want to play in the mud so that I can be in complete peace. Complete peace in my life so that I can be in the flow of health and wholeness. You see, we can make a difference. By the way, he was healed. He was healed from the virus that he had. We can stop complaining, we can stop being in that place of looking for the bad and see the good and give thanks for it. Every night before you go to bed, spend some time in gratitude. I know many of you already do that, but be sure and do that. Remember that we teach we're all one. And if we're teaching we're all one, well, we have some part in all of this, don't we? Not very many nods on that, and I understand why. It's, we are in a place and a time that with the knowledge that we have as Unity students to come above, to share love, to quit looking at them and us and see we. Can you hear that? To see we, not them, because every time we say them, we're talking about ourselves. And I know many of you have heard that when we point a finger, four fingers point back at us. We cannot do separation, but begin to look at us coming together. Are you willing to start a chain reaction of good? Are you willing to hold the high watch? From the Course in Miracles. I am at home. Fear is a stranger here. There is no home that can shelter love and fear. They cannot coexist. If you are real, then fear must be an illusion. And if fear is real, then you don't exist at all. What could you not accept if you knew that everything that happens, all events, past, present, and to come are gently planned by one whose only presence and only purpose is for your good. For your good. God is. And we have the opportunity to rise up. We have the opportunity to find that place where we remember the truth of who we are and to share the Christ within with everyone we meet. God bless you.
Step out on the water 